Welcome to the third part of my book, His Treasured Possession, What Kind of People Ought We To Be? If you've listened to any of the other videos, you know that the first one was uh, Godliness, A Value For All Things, and the second one was uh, Godliness, A Value For Knowing Him. We come to the third part of the book, which is Godliness, A Value For Sharing Him. The mystery of godliness is great. He appeared in a body, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. 1 Timothy 3.16 And Matthew 28 verses 19 and 20 tells us, Go and make disciples of all nations, and surely I am with you always. To the very end of the age. Well we now come to look at what it is we are to share with the world, this vast great needy world. What does the world need? Well it goes without saying doesn't it that the world needs the gospel and the most effective way we can present the gospel is by spirit-filled lives lived out amongst people we see day by day. I don't know whether you were like me when you look back on your Christian walk. I know that when I was first a Christian, I was so thrilled with what God had done, how he'd saved me, that I felt that every conversation I had with every person I met had to come round to the gospel. It was almost as though I was like a headhunter. I'm sure people ducked out of the way when they saw me coming. But it can be so liberating, can't it, to pray and leave the openings to God and to ask him to help us in a natural way to share him with others. In Out of the Salt Shaker by Rebecca Manley Pippet, she writes, Evangelism isn't just something you do out there and then get back to normal living. Evangelism involves taking people seriously then sharing Christ as Lord in the context of our natural living situations. We of all people should be offering the world a picture of what it means to be truly human. Henry Drummond says, Every atom in the universe can act upon every other atom, but only through the atom next to it. And if a man or a woman would act upon every other man or woman, he can do so best by acting one at a time upon those beside him. We need to be people dressed in holiness, living uh, with God in our lives. People will be attracted to us when they see Christ in us. Ron Smith says, what we are as Christians will count far more than how much we know or even do. The ideal person, personal evangelist, is a Christian who is growing in likeness to Jesus every day. Well, that's a high calling, isn't it? And we can only reflect our Saviour as day by day we walk in step with the Spirit. And one as aspect of the Holy Spirit's work in a believer is that desire that we have to make others know about Jesus. Do we have that desire? Is it there? Or are we only ever thinking about ourselves and ours? Spurgeon's one asked, uh, Spurgeon once asked, do you have a love for the lost? If you don't, you're probably one of them. Someone once said, the sick soul needs not a lecture or me on medicine, but a prescription. And we need to give that medicine uh, of the gospel that will heal people's sin-saturated souls. Christ is the remedy and the more we are saturated ourselves with him, the more likely we'll be to help others. People are, are blindly falling over a spiritual precipice and they need us uh, to help them and to be that safety net for them. In place of the distorted view the world has of the church, there should be the authentic reflection of Christ seen in his true church. 
we must be good role models to a watching world. Because we belong to him, we live for his agenda, not just our own. Spurgeon says, even if I were utterly selfish and had no care for anything but my own happiness, I would choose if I might under God to be a soul winner. For never did I know perfect, overflowing, unutterable happiness of the purest and most ennobling order, till I first heard of one who had sought and found the Saviour through my means. No young mother ever so rejoiced over her firstborn child, no warrior was so exultant, exultant over a hard-won victory. Do you say, oh, I'm hopeless uh, uh, at witnessing, I can't do it? That surely is like saying, I can't walk or talk. We are to be ourselves and ask God to open the doors for us. And he will do it. Often we don't have because we don't ask. Ron Smith says, witnessing for Christ and seeking to win others for him is not a gift, it is a calling our responsibility. We are saved to serve and call to confess Christ, one in order that we might become witnesses. What God expects of every Christian, he will surely enable each to perform. We must ask ourselves, am I a good reflection of my Saviour? Am I seeking to follow him and share him with others? Well, what else does the world need? It needs the gospel and it also needs love, love and more love. In our busy lives we can lose the plot, can't we? Or we are so busy that we forget that the most important things in life are not things but people. How do I reach the mass of people out there? Well, God's word tells us in Ephesians 2.10 that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God has given us each specific work to do for him, and uh, only we can do that work. He's given us each a unique job description. Yes, the world needs to see love, love, and more love. The world needs to see us loving one another, it's uh, not going to see love if they see infighting amongst people within a church. There'll be no desire for them to see, to, to know that sort of love. The world sees very little true, authentic love. They see it in the sacrifice on Calvary. But how many hear of that wonderful, wonderful story they need to see it in us, that sacrificial love. As Stuart Townend's uh, song says, how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face away, as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. What agony our Saviour suffered, all for our sakes. What pain the Father endured. Amazing love, vast as the ocean. The world needs to see God's love in us, genuine love, sacrificial love. We have the freedom in God's love to be ourselves, and to reach out to a dying world with the personalities, the, the failings and the frailties and the peculiarities that we have. God uses us as individuals to reach the world around us. Ephesians 5, 1, 2 says, Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. A watching world will see us, love in us, and will take note. 
Well, there are many more ways that we can reach out to the world around us. There are many, many lonely people all about us. We can have people for meals. We can have people around for coffees. We can think of many other ways in which we can reach out and uh, perhaps help those around us. And we need to ask God to give us opportunities and to be enterprising and visionary in the way in which we seek to reach the world. I was very challenged by something I read in Spurgeon. Mind you, I don't know when I'm not challenged by Spurgeon. He said, I do not see how our sense of oneness to Christ could ever have been perfected if we had not been permitted to work for him. If he had been pleased to save us by his precious blood and then leave us with nothing to do, we would have had fellowship with Christ up to a certain point. But, I speak from experience, there is no fellowship with Christ that seems so vivid, so real to the soul, as when we try to win a soul for him. Or when I come to battle with that soul's difficulties, to weep over that soul's hardness, when I'm in an agony of spirit and feel that I could die sooner than that soul perish, then I get to read the heart of him whose flowing tears and dying wounds showed how much he loved poor fallen mankind. While reading that, I often wonder, have I ever really prayed for a dying soul? I don't, I don't know whether or not you are like me. Often we can be so busy in the church and for the church that we don't have time for people outside the church. I became aware of this a number of years ago and I started asking the Lord to open up doors of opportunity so that I could speak to non-Christian people. We were about to go on holiday and our younger son uh, was coming with us and to make things easier for him coming with uh, his mum and dad, we suggested he took a friend along with him. And uh, to make it easier for this friend, we, we invited the parents for a meal to explain and for them to see that we were normal. And um, we had a lovely evening with them. And at the end of the evening, the wife, the mother of the, the, the boy who was coming with us, suggested I came along to the National Women's Register where she was the president. And um, it was a, a meeting where they met once a month and it was for professional women who came into the area and perhaps hadn't made any friends. So I was thrilled really that I was being invited to something where there were a lot of non-Christians. Well, when I asked her um, what sort of thing they did, she said, well, our next meeting, which is next week, uh, we're going to make a, we're going to have a discussion. And the discussion is the day that changed my life. Well, you can imagine, I felt God had just placed the opportunity on a plate for me. And uh, I managed to go along for quite a number of months uh, before uh, my circumstances changed and I wasn't able to go. And I had marvellous opportunities. It's so important for us to ask God He's the one who often opens the doors and gives us the opportunity to speak for him. Well, what else does the world need? It needs to see Christ's disciples living out transparently holy lives. Holiness isn't just a feeling. Oh, I feel holy today or I don't feel very holy today. It's a life lived transparently before others. Now, I don't mean that we share everything with other people. I mean that what we are in the house or in the home, we should be outside with other people. There shouldn't be any sort of uh, putting on a front for people outside. We have to keep mortifying the areas of our lives that let us down. Uh, we need to be more like Christ. Nikki Gumbel says, 
we can live a life satisfying our own selfish desires in what Martin Luther King refers to as the narrow confines of our own existence. Or we can look to the broader concerns of humanity. Not just looking on us and ours, but realising there's a world out there in great, great need. We need constantly to remind ourselves that Christ saved us to make us his disciples, not to become preoccupied with our own self-existence, but to set, be sent out into the world and to be ambassadors for him and to disciple other people and show them his love. We call to keep society from decaying by being salt, by being light to them and a cleansing influence upon them. And we can only do that when our lives are free from moral stain and compromise. And that's a great danger, isn't it, as Christians? We can become more and more like the world rather than being different and set apart from the world. We need to be in the world, but not like the world. I quote, I quote Spurgeon again. We are to attach the highest importance to our own personal holiness. God will not go to work with instruments which would compromise his own character. We must constantly remind ourselves that it does matter what we say and it does matter what we do. Many of our actions or lack of them often damage our witness. It may be a lack of thoughtfulness on our part and we need to ask God, please make me thoughtful. I remember some time ago, a non-Christian um, sharing with me, he'd broken his leg and uh, some while after, he had a scathing criticism to Christians who lived opposite him on his street. He said, if they had just come over and asked if I needed any help, Jesus would have. I expected more from them. So our world is watching us, watching our actions, watching our words, watching what we do or don't do. We'll, get, we'll never get it right with some people. Some people crit criticise us that we are Christians. But we need to be on the lookout and asking God to help us to be sensitive to the needs of people. Um, J.C. Ryle expresses it as follows. I believe there is far more harm done by holy and inconsistent Christians than we are aware of. Such men are among Satan's best allies. They pull down by their lives what ministers build with their lips. They supply the children of this world with a never-ending excuse for remaining as they are. What a terrible possibility that by our lives we are demolishing the work that our pastors are seeking to do and to build up. May we endeavour with the greatest of zeal to live those holy, transparent lives before men and women, boys and girls, for those who are older, before our grandchildren. May our lives be consistent and holy before them. Well, what else does the world need? Well, it needs prayer, prayer and more prayer. Who's going to pray for our families? Who's going to pray for our non-Christian friends? Um, who's going to pray for our neighbours? If they haven't got any Christians in their family, nobody's going to be praying for them. We have a huge responsibility and are we rising to the challenge of that? We need to covenant to pray for our families, for our friends, for our neighbours every day. And what of our town, our country? Countries around us that are lying in darkness. Uh, those who reign and rule over us. Those who are fighting in places where there's tumult and war. And the list could go on and on and on. There are far more unbelievers in this world than there are believers. And we need to be crying out to God 
and praying for them. There's so much to pray for. Who's going to pray for them if we as Christians don't? I again uh, quote Spurgeon. Your heart should be like a harbour in which ships battered by the storm can come to find refuge. Our Lord was certainly like that when he was on earth and thankfully he's still like it in heaven. Uh, he's the, He's the refuge, our refuge. I remember hearing of a Muslim who invited a minister along to his home for a meal because he wanted to share with him about his box of secrets. When the minister got there and after a while he, he, he asked where this box of secrets was and the man just tapped his chest asked why he didn't share this with his imam, the man replied, our God has no heart, but I've come to see that the Christian God has heart and therefore I think his servants have heart too. I cannot share my heart with a man whose God has no heart. Well, that's a challenge, isn't it? Have we got heart for people? Are we concerned for all people, for every tribe and every nation? We may not be able to go out into the world physically, but our praying can be global. The world should be our scope for the, our prayers and activities, and we need one another's prayers for this great, great mission. As John Wesley said, the world is my parish. But we forget at our peril that every desire we have to see a soul saved, then the devil is waiting for that soul to be damned. Thank God we're not alone in the task of evangelism. He's told us that he's praying for us, that our faith will not fail, and he has promised to be with us to the end of the age. What an encouragement to keep plodding on. Well, let's remind ourselves of what the world needs. The world needs the gospel shared and reflected by us. The world needs love, love and more love to be spirit filled and reflecting our saviour. The world needs to see a transparently holy life, genuine and sacrificial and the world needs prayer, prayer and more prayer for all the world, not just our narrow confines. We sometimes have preconceived ideas, don't we, of how the Lord works to bring salvation to a soul. And he does it in his own way. We can feel so overwhelmed at times, but God, God in his own sovereignty, sometimes without even human intervention, uh, brings people to himself. And we see that a lot in the Muslim world. Um, it is God's memorial that in every generation he hears prayer. So in the three sessions we've had on godliness, we've seen in the first part, the value in pursuing godliness. In the second, the value of knowing God experientially. And in the third, the value of sharing God. And if it only meant applying rigorous discipline uh, to our lives and pursuing God with all our hearts, then in no time at all, many of us, if not all of us, would become monuments of grace and a tremendous witness to the world. But we're not in heaven yet, are we? And life is not quite so simple. We have our sin to contend with. We have the devil to wrestle against and the world that seeks to squeeze us into its mould. All those three things impact on the way we live as Christians. 
So the fight is on for us. Every single day of every day, the Lord keeps us in this world. And we forget this warfare at our peril. If we're saved, we cannot lose our salvation. But the devil doesn't want us to go leaping and praising our way to heaven. We've looked at our goals and we've looked at God's goals for us. But let's look briefly at the devil's goals for us. He wants us, one, to fail to be godly. He wants us, secondly, to be distracted by the world so we do not have time to give to God and to get to know him better. And thirdly, he wants us to fail in our witness to a needy world. When he's done all this, he's won a resounding victory. He succeeded, he succeeded in making us ineffectual Christians, not fit for the work that Christ has called us to do. Something which often helps me is remembering uh, that there is a fight going on in the heavenlies for us, that Christ is praying for us and praying for us that our faith will not fail. And um, each time I fail, I'm conscious that the devil has um, had a hand in it, as well as my own flesh, and he is exultant. And I feel so um, deflated that I have allowed him to win that victory. And something like remembering this fight spurs me on to seek to win the fight for Christ, to bring glory to his name, to give him pleasure and not to be a failure. We, we can't not be a failure without the help of God. He's the one who keeps us, who holds us, who helps us in our fight to heaven. I close with my last quote from K.F. Pryor. Satan is a malignant reality, always hostile to God and to God's people. But he's already been defeated in Christ's life and death and resurrection. And this defeat will become obvious and complete in the end of the age. God needs his people as witnesses. It is here, right in the midst of evil, that a Christian is called upon to exhibit the power of grace, to show forth his faith in courage and patience as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. May we all prove to be such witnesses. And I hope you'll join me for the last and fourth part of my book. Thank you for listening.